New Orleans, a city of mystery, a city that one million people proudly call home, at least the ones above ground, because New Orleans is also home to many beings that can't find their way back. Watch as our group of paranormal investigators attempt to discover these lost souls. Join us as we explore New Orleans, the most haunted city in America. Now, the LaLaurie Mansion is the crown jewel of all haunted houses in the city. New Orleans is the most haunted city in America, and that is the most haunted structure in the entire parish. So it goes like this. Madame Delphine LaLaurie and her husband Louis move into the house in 1832. They are the most glamorous couple in the entire region. <laughs> not just luxurious, not just magnificent, but rich. They were worth a combined total of $4.3 million. In modern day equivalent, that's about $600 million. So they're somewhere between Bill and Melinda Gates and Brad and Angelina. You put those things together and then you put them in a magnificent mansion in the most fantastic city that the Western Hemisphere has ever known, New Orleans, in the most glamorous time to be in New Orleans, the 1830s, and what do you have? What everybody else does, parties. They didn't throw two or three keggers a month. They were throwing five or six grand, elegant, luxurious balls every week. And that brings us to April 10th, a Thursday, 1834, a day that will live in infamy in our city's history. To sort of sum up the events that took place on April 10th, 1834, uh, Madame Delphine Lalaurie is being attended to by a servant girl, uh, I believe her name was Leah, brushing her hair. The poor girl hit a snag which enraged Delphine. She retrieves a riding crop, I believe it was, a whip of some sort, possibly from beneath her vanity, and starts to attack the girl. Poor thing fled away, corned herself in the roof, so terrified of the woman, leapt off. The party ensues. She's, of course, entertaining the elite of the city. You've got over 250 guests, all soon to become eyewitnesses. And upon a raised stage in the center of the ballroom, a band is playing. The finest wine is flowing. Magnificent food is being served. Someone standing on the other side of the street, on uh, Governor Nichols, screams out, Fire! Fire! Everybody run! Because indeed, the part of the building that is separated from the central residence, now the garage, used to be the kitchen. And flames are leaping out of the windows up into the night sky. People are so terrified that this is going to be the third great fire of New Orleans, that they all run pell-mell for their lives across the street, reuniting with their friends and family. And once they've done so, they say, well, what about our host and hostess? What about Madame Delphine? What about Dr. Louis? We should go inside and help them. But they never get a chance. Because out comes a very calm army of servants and slaves, holding silver platters laden down with hors d'oeuvres. No, no, no. Please don't go anywhere. Have a bacon-wrapped scallop. Have a leftover peacock's tongue. Stay where you are. Everything's going to be all right. Out come two wine casks, one rolled on either side of the street. They're tapped. People are continuing to drink and enjoy themselves. The band sets down off the stage, crosses the street, and continues to play. I mean, this is beginning to look like the A-deck of the Titanic, as people are having a truly magnificent experience. Finally, the police and the fire brigade show up. They go upstairs to the kitchen, and at the center of the flames, there's a survivor. 70-year-old woman, cook, chained to the stove by her ankle. I'm understanding she had nothing but a cot to sleep in and a bucket for her business, but when she was unchained and taken across the street, she confessed not just before the mayor, but also before an editor of the newspaper at that time. I will not stay in that house one more night knowing what they are doing to us. And she tells them in her final words that she has set the fire intentionally in a suicide attempt. She had misbehaved that morning, some minor infraction of house rules and was going to be disciplined that night after the party by Madame Delphine herself being taken to the uppermost room. Now, she doesn't know what happens in the uppermost room, but she knows that anyone who ever went there before never came back. And she's so terrified at the prospect of what might be going on up there that she's willing to commit suicide by burning herself alive rather than learn the truth. Naturally intrigued, the fire marshal and the police chief go upstairs to said uppermost room. It has a 300-pound oak door blocking the only entrance, sealed in the last 20 to 30 minutes by best estimation with hot tar and then braced with a large cypress beam. These grown men 
burly and strong struggle to beat down this door using that brace as a battering ram. It takes them about half an hour. And when the final splinters of the door fall down to the floor, so do the grown men of the police department and the fire brigade, to their knees, vomiting uncontrollably, because they have just been overwhelmed by the stench of rotting human flesh. The fire marshal lights two lanterns, hands the first one to the police chief, who takes out a pistol, walks in, goes to the right. The fire marshal with his own lantern and a club walks in and goes to the left. Though he enters second, he cries out first because he bumps into something. One of two operating tables, upon which a man and a woman have been chained, and they are still alive. Brings the lantern closer and finds that he's mistaken. Well, yes, they are still alive. No, they're no longer a man and a woman. They are the victims of a crude sex change operation. Several slaves were found in various stages of torture. I understand one gentleman had his mouth sewn shut uh, when they cut through the stitching, found his mouth stuffed with feces. Then the police chief has his moment. He goes over to the right where he finds a male slave, arms chained above his head. His face has been sliced down the middle and across the center from ear to ear underneath his nose. Each quadrant of his face has been meticulously peeled back and pinned to a corresponding portion of his skull. And it appears that there are violent muscle contractions going on underneath where his face used to be. When they bring that lantern closer, they find that those are not muscles contracting. Those are maggots feeding. Maggots intentionally introduced by Dr. Louis in a sadistic experiment to see how long human life can be sustained with the vermin eating the infection that grows there. Now, Imagine being one of those people standing out on the street on Governor Nichols, sipping your wine, listening to the band, having really what's just an outrageous party. Then the human atrocities, one after another, come down from the uppermost room, paraded past them down a few blocks to go to the hospital, where every single one of them was euthanized, put out of their misery. Because I'm only just talking about here the, uh, the ones who are still alive. There were dozens of people who had not survived these outright tortures and sadistic experiments. And when the crowd assembled on the other side of the street saw their remains, they were whipped into an angry mob. They wanted to go inside and lynch the Lallerys. But the problem is, $4.3 million will buy you an awful lot of police officers. 98 of them accepted uh, hefty bribes with axes, rifles, and clubs. They formed barricades at either end of the street, and they held back the swelling mob all night long. And 10.30 in the morning on April 11th, the doors of the main mansion open wide, and out comes a carriage led by six black horses driven by Bastian, the loyal slave, who has a pistol in one hand and a bullwhip in the other. He parks the carriage right there, out comes Dr. Louis with a rifle, looking menacing at the crowd. Madame Delphine, very calmly and casually, walks out of the door, looks at both ends of the crowd, and then, according to legend, has the audacity to wave before stepping inside and closing the door. And they make their way safely all the way by way of Bayou St. John to Le Pontchartrain where schooners already waiting for them. Carries them across to Mandeville. They liquidate their assets and take all that golden cash up to New York City, where they spend nine days going jewelry shopping, dress shopping, and attending the opera. We know this, we still have their receipts. And then they book passage to Paris and disappear. Most scholars agree that the likely outcome of their story is that they arrived safely in Paris under assumed names. With all of that money, no one asked any questions. They lived happily ever after, having never been brought to justice for their crimes. We, on the other hand, were left with a blight of our city's history. This is a woman who came from money, married into money. She obviously saw the slaves as well beneath her, but you have to understand, this poor girl witnessed her father getting decapitated by a slave during a slave riot in Santo Domingo. This scarred her mentally from a very young age, and she never got over it. Hence, I believe, she was taking advantage of her, her wealth and her previous husband's wealth and buying these people and venting her frustration on them in such a horrendous manner. I, I, I always chalk it up to the worst case scenario of xenophobia that I've ever heard of, fear of other cultures. Pure and simple fear and ignorance. Stay tuned for more Haunted New Orleans. You're watching Haunted New Orleans. It is instantly known as the haunted house. April 12th, people walking by on that same side of the street heard screams, unearthly groans from inside. And they were so convinced that whatever may be generating it must be demonic in nature, they called the likeliest person, 
the Roman Catholic priest. They said, you've got to go inside and exercise this building. The priest's response was, hell no. So he then hires six Protestant American soldiers, and they go in with him on April 16th. They go inside, and they're in for about 15 minutes, because they heard, quote, otherworldly languages of the dead being spoken by angry spirits, unquote. There's a period in the 1880s where the home was occupied by a variety of families. There is a woman who uh, does make a report to a local paper. She claims she is uh, heading towards her children's rooms, I believe, found a woman holding what she believed was her own child, I understand, and then hurls this infant down the stairs. As it turns out, it wasn't hers. It was evidently the spirit of someone else's child. We don't know who, I don't know who. And there was a, a very similar incident shortly after that. She also made the, this report about going into the room, found a woman hovering over the crib, rushes towards the crib to protect her child. The woman disappears right before her and then realizes her baby has a sock stuffed in her mouth. She quickly removes it. The baby was fine. But I shudder to think that Delphine Laurie could actually affect the physical plane, actually suffocate somebody. That is just too terrible to imagine. 1953, city council apparently uh, even considered buying the building. But then another developer came in and said, well, we're going to do it and we're going to convert it into apartments and get people from out of town to live in them. Brilliant! And so that's precisely what they did. But of course, renovations require, among other things, putting down new floorboards. So they go in in the summer of 1953, and they're about ready to put down modern plumbing. But first they rip up the old floorboards, and they find underneath a lot more than old plumbing. They find eight human skeletons, full signs of great distress underneath the floorboards, especially when you consider the horror that the underside of the floorboards had scratch marks. Eight people had been buried alive inside that mansion. And now we know more about the legends that started about this place being haunted back in the 1830s. People hearing screams from the other side of the street. Those weren't ghosts. Those were real people underneath the floorboards begging for help. And they did not speak French or Spanish or English, but rather an obscure dialect of Senegambian. These were illegally smuggled West African slaves. They were crying out for help in the only way they knew how which was of course then misinterpreted as otherworldly languages of the dead being spoken by angry spirits. On a different level, I have already mentioned that I'm a tour guide and one thing that happened to me personally is that over the course of my two and a half years being a haunted history tour guide, I have had no less than 23 people on my tours faint. When it happens, I try to make certain it's either from you know, dehydration, too much drinking, medical condition, before I chalk it up to direct paranormal effect from the home itself. Andrew was our guide. He's magnificent, by the way. And I was standing taking pictures, as he told, of the torture and the mayhem that went on inside the house. Before we left, my daughter came to my side and told me that she was about to faint. I thought she was just feeling the heat, but soon after she went down and out. This is the first and only time she has ever fainted. She rested, and a second later she was fine. Needless to say, this ended the tour for us. And I'm somewhat less of a skeptic now. Thanks for the great tour. As far as visual evidence, photographic evidence from the Lori Mansion, uh, countless orbs appeared in photographs. I don't jump the gun and dub every single orb as proof. There's always the possibility of dust through just the foot traffic or the, the, the motor traffic. Uh, the humidity down here, definitely, that, that will give you some illusions of activity in photographs as well. But as far as people seeing things, yes. Uh, it, uh, there have been a few accounts where people have actually seen what looks like smoke entering or exiting the home. Uh, there was a period where shortly after I joined the company, uh, my girlfriend would walk along with me on the tour, and sometimes she gets ahead of me. She knows my route. She would often get to the Lori Mansion before me. And on a few different occasions, she would report seeing the tail of a gown going through one of the doors uh, right there from the street. 
uh, doors we know are not actually being used. They're bolted shut. They're primarily windows these days. Uh, I have seen what I suspect was Delphine looking out of the window. Um, uh, at one point she was on uh, a rear balcony. But uh, yeah, there have been countless, countless sightings that I can recall. Between 1953 and 2006, it was apartments. People from all over the country and around the world will come in and stay inside. And the average length of stay was about one year. You know, we can still speak to a lot of them to this day. My name is Annie Sobel. I lived in the Lalari house back in the mid-60s. I lived there with my father and my younger brother, Stephen. One evening, uh, my father was walking us home from an uh, evening out. we just come from dinner. And we were across the street on Royal, directly across, diagonally across the street. And I glanced up at the top of the building. And I saw what I could have sworn to be a child sitting on top of the roof. Looked like a little girl. She was wearing something white, and her legs were dangling over the side of the roof. And I gasped. I was a little frightened. By the time, I, I turned to my father, and I said, Dad, Dad, look up. And by the time he looked up, there was nothing there. But I saw that little girl sitting on the rooftop. The story of the little girl, I used to see her in the courtyard. I said, who are you? What happened to you? Please tell me where you are, what's going on. Did she actually beat you and stuff like that? And she never answered me. She disappeared. Disappeared. I'm sure she was a slave, you know, and, uh, but, but couldn't see her face. She had her hair, actually, all, a lot of hair on her face. And she was always with the head down, sitting like that. But what can I tell you? It was. It was frightening. And to this day, I will neither ride by there or walk by there in the, once, once it's dark because I'm so afraid that I might see that, that little girl. 